and welcome to Setting History Straight. This is Linda Watson, and we have with us Carl Dillon back. Carl? Good morning. Are you there? Good morning. Oh. So let's go ahead and get started. We want to start by talking about the founding of Britain, and Britain had people in it at a much early age, and we the historians pick up on the legend of Brutus coming to England and landing in London around 1103. Now, Brutus was one of the Trojan kings that we know that came out of Rome. He basically was one of the descendants of Anetus. Anetus was his grandfather. If y'all have not heard that story about the Trojan kings, go back and, and listen to that broadcast. I have it out on my webpage. But Brutus fled because he accidentally had killed his father, practicing bow and arrow, and he fled from the land of Rome and went to Britain. And he was accepted because they found out he was a Trojan king, and the people were, at that time were happy for him to come. And they had a big conference and convention and voted and welcomed him to be their king. He was from the line of Zerah. That was really Judah's two sons. If you remember the story mm -hmm. of, of Perez and, and Zerah, Zerah was the son that raised his hand up and the, the midwife tied a cord, a red cord, royal cord around his hand. And he pulled his hand back in and his brother was born instead, if you remember that story. Basically, around the first century, Caesar began to push his way into England and really a first century BC and and he was very gentle when he came into Britain and he, he established basically a uh, a colony there. Mm -hmm. he, he was the one that was of the, the Trojan kings. The lines of Judah, the, the Zara line, they came out and they settled in Troy and when Troy fell, they went to Rome. And of course, Rome had already been settled by that time, but they did settle a place called Alba Longa. Anetus basically became their king, and he was a Trojan king. Now, his son was uh, Silvius, and he had a son named Brutus, and Brutus was the one that eventually wound up in uh, Britain. And they, it's interesting because the city of London was originally named Lundium, and that is the mm -hmm. Hebrew word for New Troy. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And, isn't that interesting? Yes, I, I knew about Lundium, but I didn't know that it was actually Hebrew. Right. It's yeah. very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually we said Caesar would try to push his way in into Britain, and they did establish a colony there, and but they basically let the people in Britain just rule themselves, kind of like overseers, more or less. But they never did venture into Scotland. I think that's very interesting. They never did venture into Scotland, and they created this wall. Could you tell the audience a little bit about that wall? Oh, that wall is quite interesting. It runs the full length of the country. It's uh, kind of like the uh, Wall of China, only it's not nearly so magnificent. But it really separates northern England from, from Scotland. It was built by the Emperor uh, Hadrian not to keep uh, the Picts out. The ancient Scots were extremely uh, very warlike. They didn't like the Romans at all. Uh, th the wall is interesting because in it were barracks and it was like a gigantic fort because it, it not only was just a wall, it housed the soldiers and the families of the soldiers who uh, were stationed there. And they had rotating duties in and out. Uh, a lot of the soldiers would come with their families and stay there. And some would go for four or five years and then rotate out and, and others would come in. They found all kinds of artifacts there. Uh, First of all, it's kind of interesting. A great many of the soldiers had their own families, raised children there. They had schools. They had uh, a variety of different religious temples that they uh, bore really no resemblance to the religion of Christ. But they were represented there, too. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the interesting thing about this is the reason they built the walls to keep the picks out. Yep. And the Picts were just unbelievable Scottish warriors. Actually, they would frizz their hair up and they would paint their bodies and mm -hmm. they just scared wits out of the Roman soldiers. Yeah. Blue. They painted themselves blue. Just scared uh, them to death. Yeah. So, they were fearsome. Yeah, they were fierce. 
they were big too. They, you know, they were they were not small people. They were big and burly and strong. And if you've ever tried to to wield uh, a Scottish claymore sword, you know that if you, you if you were pulling that thing around in combat all day long, you had to have some muscles in your hands, your wrists, and your arms. Let me tell you. That's true. <laughs> and you know the the interesting thing is when the Picts went out to to fight the Romans, said they brought the heads of the Romans back put them on a post and stuck them in their yard. They were one of the last remaining groups to use chariots. It was another common practice to take uh, the heads of your victims and put them on the back of your chariots. Now, I want to talk about the Celtic church. And uh, we know that Caesar wrote about the Druids and people have the wrong concept about the Druids. There was some pagan Druids. We're not going to say that was didn't happen, but Caesar wrote that they memorized large portions of the Bible and they studied the Bible diligently. And I, I think that's interesting because that's not the picture that's painted about the Druids. Now, we assume that Joseph of Arathea was one of the first people that came to Britain. And I'm going to read you about that from the actual historians. Now, this is the quote that I'm going to read you is from Baronius, who is the curator of the Vatican Library. And he wrote Exclusions Annals. Okay, well, that's the story that the Vatican says that Joseph of Arathea came to Britain. And it says, Joseph, with many disciples, traveled from the Holy Land by a Phoenician boat and landed in Marseilles, and then went to Gaul in the year of 36 AD. And from there, Joseph went out to England and established seminaries and sent out missionaries. Now, this is backed up by two other historians. One is Gladius. He was a Welsh Celtic Christian monk wrote the Christian history entered into Britain during the reign of Tiberius, who died in 37 AD. So he's backing up what the Vatican has written here. He says that Christianity went into Britain during the reign of Tiberius, and Tiberius died in 37 AD. So he's backing up that information. Then we also had Gregory of Tours. He says, it is believed that Joseph of Arathea was the first to preach the gospel in Britain, and it confirmed by many writers. Okay, so these are three historical sources from that time period. Now, we also have this, and this, this is Cressy, the monk and historian, tells us that Joseph of Arathea died in Glossenbury on July 27th, AD 82, and on his tombstone is written in Latin, After I buried the Christ, I came to the islands of the West, and I taught and entered into my rest. So there you have it. Three, yeah. Actually, four historians at that time picked that information up. And, and wrote about that. And, and I think the most convincing thing that was, was written was written in the 5th century when St. Augustine came to Britain. He was the one that supposedly brought Christianity to Britain. That's what our history books tell us, huh? right? But we know better than that. We know that it, these people were already being taught by the disciples at a much earlier time frame and already were Christian before St. Augustine ever actually got there. But yeah. they, he had a very interesting statement that he made, and he said that, I saw the church that the Messiah built with his own hands. That's a quote from St. Augustine. And I think that's fascinating information. Very fascinating. I've been to England a couple of times. And one of the trips I took over there, I did go to Bath, which uh, for those uh, of you who don't know, uh, was a Roman resort city, um, yeah. famous for its baths. And that's why they call it <laughs> Beautiful place. They named the city after these hot spring baths. Uh, but their legends are replete with stories about the young Christ who came. I've, I've heard some say with his father and others say with, with uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was reputed to be Christ's uncle. The folk music and songs which sing of the Christ 
uh, think of one of them that still survived to this day. Oh, Blackmore's Night. It's a story about uh, Joseph and, and Jesus walking along the road. It's a very beautiful song. And them sharing uh, bread and fishes and a jug of good wine. That he was in England, I have no doubt. Well, I, I don't have a doubt either because there's way too much information. Even, and I think that's very interesting. Now, I want to talk just briefly about the Celtic Church. And that Celtic Church that was set up was not only set up by Joseph of Arathea. We also know that Peter went into Britain. That's what recorded also. Everybody believes that he went into Rome. He did go into Rome for a short period, but his assigned area was Britain. So he was also helping evangelize the people at that time. Now, I'm going to show you some proof from the Catholic Church, what Gladius says. It says, and he's writing about the people in Britain. He said, the Britons are contrary to the whole world, enemies to Rome's usage, not only in the mass, Along with the Jews, they serve the shadows of things to come rather than the truth. It does. <laughs> it says, usage is not in the mass. Along with the Jews, they serve the shadows of th things to come wow. rather than the truth. Then he goes on and it says. It's an apt description of Israel. <laughs> that they derive their customs from the time when the church was Judaizing in all things. So meaning the word Judaizing was a common word back then. It meant that you follow Torah. Mm -hmm. So he said they derived their customs from a time when the church was Judaizing in many things. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is. And so I'm going to go on and prove that point further that these people that were in Britain were, were basically following the Torah. And I, I'm, I'm going to start with the history of St. Patrick's, that everybody calls St. Patrick's, um, and everybody assumes that he was Catholic. Well, when I finish this discussion, you're going to find out today that he was not Catholic. Now, even in his own writings, now, he basically was born in a place called Dunbaran in southern Scotland around the year of 389 AD. His father was a deacon. His grandfather was the clergyman in the church where he went to church. And basically, he, at the age of 16, decided to strike out on his own. Now, that's not uncommon for a, a, someone in the, that age frame to be rebellious and like to get out on their own. And it didn't take him long. He got with the wrong crowd and he got sold into slavery and he was brought to Ireland. And there was a druid in Ireland named Melichok. All right, so Melichok bought him and he herded cattle for this pagan chieftain for six years. And then he had a dream and he dreamed that he went back to his homeland, which was Scotland. And he dreamed that he saw this boat and this boat was in the water and it took him back to his homeland. And he took that dream to mean that it was a message from God to try and escape and go home. And that's what he did. And he, as he trying to get back to the ship, he saw the same familiar things that he had saw in the dream. It was like he knew the dream was prophetic. And he said when he got to the ship, it was like the people on the ship were just waiting for him. And he walked aboard with no question. As soon as he got on, they took off. Hmm. And I, that's an amazing story. And when he got back home, it was like the prodigal son came home. You know, and he told his mom and dad he would never leave them again. And that he, would, he had learned his lesson and that he wanted to stay there in Scotland. When he reached, I guess, his late 30s, he had another dream. And it was a dream that an angel had come to him. And his, the angel's name was Victorious. And Victorious told him, you need to go back to Ireland and you need to teach the people in Ireland. With a heavy heart, he went back to Ireland. He did not want to return back to Ireland, but he felt like that God was calling him back to that land. When he got to Ireland, it was almost Passover. Nobody else was allowed to light a light for Passover until the king lit the light. Well, St. Patrick lit his before then, and the king had him brought to the palace. And he said, what have you done? Why did you break our traditions? And he started teaching the king and the king became a believer. And it wasn't long after that, St. Patrick's had founded over 250 Sabbath keeping and Torah keeping churches. Uh -huh. But, yeah. you know, just to talk more about 
When he started his churches, he had a prayer book, and it had the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it also had the books of the Torah. He would handwrite those and put those in every church that he founded. And because it wasn't the Vulgate, it was their own actual Bible. Now, they have four copies of that book in the British Museum. It's called the Lege Moshe is the name of that book that he put in the churches at that time. And so that's the real story of St. Patrick's. Now, we want to talk about proof that he was a Sabbath keeper. And let's, I'm just going to see if I can read you a few quotes from some leading historians here. Oh, please um, do. All right. The first one is from A.C. Flick. He said the Celtics used a Latin Bible unlike the Vulgate. They kept Saturday as their day of rest with special religious services on Sunday, which they did. They did on both days. Mm -hmm. But Saturday was their Sabbath. And he goes on and it says it seems to have been the custom of the Celtic church of the early times in Ireland as well as Scotland to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. Okay, now the next quote is from Moffat, James C. Moffat. He wrote the Moffat translation of the Bible, and it says, It seems to have been customary in the Celtic church of early times in Ireland as well as Scotland to keep the Sabbath, Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. And that is from James C. Moffat. The Church of Scotland, page 140. Mm -hmm. now, and this is from Skinner, who basically wrote a book from Adamon, Life of St. Columba. Now, that goes w much further back in history. In this latter instance, they seem to follow a custom of which we first trace the early monastery church of Ireland by which they kept Saturday to be their Sabbath on which they rested from all their labors. So here's three historians. Adamon was a historian that wrote 200 years after the time of St. Patrick's. He's a current historian writing from that period of time. Everybody believes that St. Augustine came into Britain and he brought the Catholic faith and the people were pagans and they became Christianized. This is not true. And I want to tell you the real story of St. Augustine. Now, when St. Augustine arrived, I think it was 596 AD, he was not even welcomed by the churches of that time. An old sage told the Celtic ministers, if he doesn't greet you when you go in to meet him, turn and walk out. They said that he treated them with arrogance and would not speak to them. And so they turned and walked out. Now, the entire area basically was under the Celtic church. There was only two there was two counties that went with the Catholic Church, and this was the extent of the Catholics' control over mm -hmm. Britain. It, it really is not the story that these people portray today. In fact, in 664 AD, there was a dispute over when Passover was to be kept. King Oswe said, we're going to settle this matter now. And so he brought the, the Celtic church and he brought the Roman Catholic church together and each one presented their case. And Oswe, as luck would have it, went with the Catholic church. He agreed that the Catholic church was correct based on the fact that they claimed that Peter was their founding apostle. Now, that set it on a track at that point to uh, have a lot of Catholic influence, but it's still the Catholic Church didn't actually take a strong foothold until 1172. And in 1172, Henry II came to power, and he pushed in the Catholic faith at that time in Britain, and he took his troops into Ireland, and he took control of Ireland. That's when Ireland went under British rule. And they turned over the keys to the Celtic church to him, and he turned the church over to the Catholic church. And that was almost the 12th century. These people were still keeping Saturday Sabbath until the 12th century. And we also know that Scotland did not change their teaching on the Sabbath until, what was it, 1069 AD, when Malcolm married Margaret, 
from the Franks. She was a princess from the kingdom of the Franks. She was Catholic, a devout Catholic, and she convinced her husband, Malcolm, to change the Sabbath to Sunday. But the Scots were still keeping the Sabbath until the 11th century. You had the people in uh, Ireland and Britain that were still keeping the Sabbath until the 12th century. This is not anything like what we've been told. Just not anything like what we've been told. Just totally Completely. different story. Completely now, different. You know, everyone thought after 600, after they changed Passover to Easter in 646 by King Oswy, they thought that People thought, well, that, at that point, Britain just became Catholic. No, they did not, because we had a, another king named Alfred the Great who came in and he took, he was a Jewish king, and he was the one that stopped the Viking raids that were beginning to happen in that area. He reigned around the 8th century. He actually took the laws of the statues from the Bible exactly the way they're written and put them into English law. And that's the most incredible thing you've ever seen. And he took the people and divided them into groups of 10, 100, and 1,000. And over a group of 1,000, he put a person he called a sheriff. And that was a captain of 1,000. Mm -hmm. The same organization that you see in the Bible. And he's the only king that England ever called great. He was called Alfred the Great. Now, you can find this information in a book called Building Holy Nations, Lesson from the Bible and American Christian History by Stephen MacDonald. And he tells the entire story how Alfred the Great, could, I mean, Alfred the Great had many, many problems because he had a, a serious problem with epilepsy. Is this the story that you've been told? No. Not at all. No, not at all. It's just not the history we've been told. Now... Now, we want to move forward in time now, and we want to start talking about the Protestant Reformation. And around 1348 to 1352, there were 25 million people died from the Black Plague. There was I the think. peak period, but actually the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death, went well into the uh, – up to the 16th century. Right. You know, uh, when the – Protestants came over here from the New World. One of the reasons to, was to escape religious persecution, but another one was to get their families out of there because uh, nearly three-fifths of Europe died. Right, it did. And I find it interesting that it coincided with the Inquisition. Right, exactly. It's you know, isn't that amazing? You, mm -hmm. you, you draw a, a great analogy. And the people at that time, they thought the end of the world had come. Yes, they did painted and, signs on their houses and they said mm -hmm. god have mercy on us and they would paint red crosses on their door and they they just were devastated and they thought the end of the world was coming well uh for a lot of them it certainly did come uh, exactly at least as far as we know one of the most if not the most horrendous tragedies uh in human history we don't talk a whole lot about it, but people were reduced to cannibalism. Uh, murder was uh, just rampant. It also occurred during the time, one of those years, and I can't remember the year, but there was no summer. Uh, wow. So nothing grew. And all it takes is just one year for that to happen. And starvation just multiplies itself by the millions. Well, what happened is... In the cities, people were starving to death. Uh, this is really not a very pretty story, but it's true, and maybe it should be told. Butchers, who had no more animals to kill, were kidnapping and butchering human beings and selling them in the markets. Wow. And, you know, they saw the things that were going on. They thought they were living at the end time. Ezekiel 7 talks about a third will die by pestilence. A third mm -hmm. will die by war, and a third would escape. But it, they thought they were living at that time frame. I can it, understand why they would think so. If we were living during that period of time, we might think the same thing. Absolutely. So uh, it really drove the people back to their religious roots, and they began to question their religious beliefs. Right. I believe, I fir firmly believe that the Black Plague was sent to bring people to their knees. That was to bring them to a point of repentance. Now, this was the perfect time for the real Protestant Reformation to start. We're told that 
Martin Luther started the, the Protestant Reformation. That is not true. It was started by John Wycliffe, and he actually did, lived during this period. He was born in 1320 and died in 1384. He was a Saturday Sabbath keeper. He kept the holy days. He had many followers. But when the Catholic Church came in to question what he was teaching, and he was teaching against the Catholic beliefs, when they came in to question him, all his friends scattered. He did not have one friend. And he did not die a martyr. He's one of the few people that did not die a martyr. Although when he did die, the Roman Catholic Church came in, dug his body up, and ground his bones up and threw them in the, in the Thames River. Because they were so outraged by him. Now, he wrote the first Bible in English. Because he said, we need a Bible in our own language. Yes. So he wrote the first Bible by hand in English. Mm -hmm. Now, he set, kind of set the pace which, for what would happen next, which basically was probably the, one of the most unbelievable stories. Now, in 1496, John Colette, his father was the mayor of London, so he was, a, he was given a lot of leeway that other teachers would not have been given. He was allowed to go into the St. Paul's Cathedral and read the Bible in English. So he took the old translations, not the Vulgate, translated it, and he would read it in English. The people were so amazed. They recorded that there was 20,000 people standing outside the St. Paul's Cathedral to hear him speak. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine 20,000 people standing outside the church to hear someone speak? Nothing happens in a vacuum, and, and certainly the Protestant Reformation, because the, the Catholic Church had become so corrupt. People, although they were uneducated, a lot of them weren't stupid. Once you are told that you can't read something under penalty of death, I don't know about you, it just entices me even more. Right. right. The, by that time, the Vulgate, which was the Catholic Bible, had been changed so many times that it really didn't sound like the original translation. And the people thought they were hearing heresy. They said, this can't be true. This is not what we've been told. They hadn't heard the Bible read in their language in 600 years. Is that not unbelievable? Wow. And, and Wycliffe had a follower who was, well, he had several followers, but one of them was, I believe, Calvin. John Calvin has an incredible story all by himself. John Calvin was born in France. He started preaching very anti-Catholic doctrines. He was, uh, he was a believer in, in Puritanism, and by Puritanism, we have a misconception about that. Puritans were not called Puritans because they were holier than thou. It was when people could begin to read the Bible after Wycliffe and had it read to them, and then eventually the printing press was invented by Gutenberg, right. they wanted to return to the pure religion of God. And so they were called Puritans, not because they were holier than thou. They, they wished to return to purity. John Calvin was one of those people. I don't believe in everything that he preached. Calvin was forced out of France. I believe he went to Britain. He was forced out of Britain. And I believe he went to uh, Switzerland. And I think that's where he died. The important thing to remember about John Calvin is that a lot of the religious roots that we have in this country from the Seventh-day Baptist to uh, the Puritan churches that f first settled in New England were all rooted in Calvinism. Yes, they were. In fact, many of them claimed to be Calvinist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, at that point, re the religious fever spread from England to Europe. And in October 31st, we know this story, 1517, right. Martin Luther nailed his famous 95 Theses yeah. to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And basically, that was the day of Halloween. Mm -hmm. And he was excommunicated by Leo the, the Tenth and banned from the empire. He went basically underground for the most part, and he started writing the Bible in German. Mm -hmm. And Tyndale joined him in that area, and he wrote the first English Bible in 1526. Mm -hmm. And anybody caught with these English Bibles, they were killed. Oh, yes, they were burned like, at the stake. They were burned as, at the stake. As heritage. Now, the only thing that saved Martin Luther was the fact that he was a German. 
Right. Because Germany was at the boiling point politically with the Catholic Church when he did that. And the selling of indulgences, what the Catholic Church was doing was to say, you give us so much money, when you die, you'll bypass purgatory and go straight to heaven. <laughs> well, exactly. this was such an outrageous, superstitious, and such an obvious con. Martin Luther was able to escape the headsman's axe or, or, or the fire pit because he was a German and the Germans protected him. Right. I mean, and he basically is the one they gave credit for during the Protestant Reformation when actually Wycliffe had done that. But I think really and truly the reason they don't give Wycliffe the credit is because he was a tour keeper. Well, that's, that could be. That's probably the reason. Now, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Henry VIII. And Henry was acutely aware of the fact that he had no male heir. And he was worried that he had only one surviving child, Mary, to show for his marriage to Catherine. And now she was in her 40s. So the king asked the cardinal to appeal to Pope Clement VII for an annulment. It was clear that he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, who was the lady in waiting to the first wife. But the Pope was afraid that he would anger the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, the king's wife. So in 1533, Henry VIII broke from the church and married now pregnant Anne Boleyn in a secret ceremony. Henry was excommunicated by the Pope, and this broke a five-generation relationship that England had with Rome. In September of that same year, Anne gave birth to a daughter named Elizabeth. She would become the future Queen Elizabeth I. Now, Henry still didn't have a male heir. Anne Boleyn had had two miscarriages, and he grew tired of, of not having a male heir. So he had her arrested in 1536 on a trumped-up charge of adultery and publicly beheaded her at the Tower of London. Now, Henry's third marriage was to Jane Seymour, who was the lady-in-waiting for the second wife. Unbelievable. And she finally produced the son he so desperately desired. Edward was born in 1537, and Jane died shortly after childbirth. Henry ordered that she be granted a queen's funeral. Now, God allowed these events to occur so that there would be a, a chance for a huge awakening and revival in this country of England. The people were truly moving away from their original roots, which were with the Catholic Church, to a Protestant faith. He had a law in his land that if you were caught with the Bible, we mentioned that, you were burned at the stake. Well, Tyndale went back to Britain and brought his Bible. And when he did, many people had those Bibles. And Tyndale was betrayed by one of his dearest friends. And they brought him to prison. The, and he stayed there five years before they actually brought him out and he was martyred. He was burned at the stake. When he was being burned, he said, Heavenly Father, please open the eyes of the king. And he was talking about Henry VIII. Mm. And within a year of that time frame, Henry VIII had a change of heart and it allowed the peoples to have the Bible in English. And we know that that had something to do with the prayer that Tyndale prayed. But Henry VIII went so far as to even create his own Bible, which is called the Great Bible, and he put it in every church. Now, you remember, this is all God's plan because God brought circumstances in Henry VIII's life to, for him to separate himself from the Catholic Church. I mean, that's basically what was going on here. You know, it's a strange thing about the people of Britain. They stood their ground. There was 4,000 people dying under Henry VIII. They refused to give up their Bibles. They refused to give up their English Bibles. And again, he really had a change of heart because I think that prayer that Tyndale prayed. And anytime we have to realize our words, because when we say things, we need to know that God hears them and he honors a lot of the things that we say. So we have to be careful about what we say sometimes. But I think this is a very interesting story that Henry VIII, we know, left his throne to his son who was very sickly and he did not stay on the throne very long. And that was Edward. And then he left it to Jane Grey, who only lasted on the throne maybe five days when Mary Tudor came and actually took over the throne from Jane Grey. 
and Mary Tudor reestablished the Catholic faith, and there was another huge martyrdom again. Well, yes, they on. called her Bloody Mary, as a matter exactly. of fact, because of all the uh, murders she committed. She tried to push in the Catholic faith again, mm -hmm. and after her, Queen Elizabeth came to the throne. Mary, Queen of Scots, was passed over, and the throne was given to Queen Elizabeth. That is by destiny, because at that point, God was trying to allow an, a window for the Protestants to be able to keep some sentiments of their faith. But you're absolutely right in saying that God was preparing a path, uh, and that, that path was going through England. But generally speaking, the path to the West was through England. Exactly. That's where mm -hmm. it started. Yep. And, and he couldn't do it on, if, if the country was Catholic. So the interesting part of that is that Queen Elizabeth, when she came to power, she basically put in something called the Uniformity Act. And the Uniformity Act said now everybody has to go to church on Sunday. And if you don't, you pay five pence. And for a poor person, that was a lot of money. But that's when we saw Bradford and we saw many of the early pilgrims going into the prisons because they refused to go to church on Sunday. And they, this would eventually bring them to Holland where they would live and go into Holland and eventually flee from Holland and sail to America. And we're going to tell the whole story of the pilgrims another time when we get to America because I want to make a connection uh, and prove to you that they were Sabbath. Holland was a place where dissidents could go and live without having a problem, and they could ascend to the to the New World through through the Dutch, who were at that time uh, a challenging sea power worldwide. Absolutely, that was the tribe of Zebulon, if you remember. They had the merchant ships. They had the ability for them to go to America. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what actually drove the pilgrims to America was that they saw the war coming between the Dutch and the, and the Spanish. I was just sitting here thinking as you were talking about how events race forward at about that particular part of time. You have uh, Tinsdale, you have Calvin, you have Wycliffe, you have Martin Luther, and you have the invention of the printing press. All of this sort of thing all f fits together in kind of a, a knowledge explosion. At the same time, the Inquisition was still murdering people by the tens of thousands, and the Black Death was doing the same thing. All of this was going on. It's not unlike our own time today. And all these things came together at that same period of time, which turned uh, Europe into a sort of a, a knowledge explosion. Everything good and bad seemed to be going on in this same particular time period. And we, we mentioned the uh, Black Death going so long, and that certainly didn't help. We already talked about the famines. Well, it's kind of like the Internet. In our own time, we have all this evil going around us in governments and people. We have more evil uh, governments extant upon the earth than probably at any other time in world history, where God is f it being mocked, ridiculed, um, uh, Christ's followers are being persecuted to the death in some places on the earth, and I have no doubt that it will eventually come here. Exactly. At the same time, we have this horrendous knowledge explosion. The fact that we're having this show is proof of that. Things that 30 years ago, we didn't know. And then exactly. all of a sudden, with the Internet, which has certainly been a big boost, we've suddenly become privy to all the knowledge of the Earth worldwide. Absolutely. Now, during Elizabeth's reign, we had the famous Spanish Armada, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Philip II of, of Spain was the most powerful, wealthy man in Europe in the latter part of the 16th century, and he felt it was his duty to the Catholic Church to lead the Protestant English back to the Catholic faith, even by force if necessary. Now, by May 1588, the Armada was finally ready to sail. They had had 130 ships and 30,000 soldiers. But these naval vessels were basically converted from merchant ships, and they were not really sea vessels. In the first attack, the Spanish led 60 ships against the English. During the night, the English set fire to several of their own ships and let them drift into the Spanish ships. 
The second battle was on July the 29th at Gravelines. The English were victorious again, but the Spanish losses were not great. Only three ships were sunk. Now the tides turned for the English. God sent a turbulent storm, and a series of storms scattered the Spanish ships, resulting in heavy damage. By the time the ships returned back to Spain, they had lost over half the ships and three-fourths of the men. Now the people in England actually felt that God had given them the victory. The storms that scattered the Armada was seen as intervention from God. And there were special services thanking God for the victory. There was even a commemorative medal made which had the following quote, God blew it and they were scattered. This is just amazing history. Now, when Queen Elizabeth died, James I came to power. Mm -hmm. He was the first Scottish king to come sit on an English throne, which is very significant because mm -hmm. he was from the line, healed line of both Ferris and Zara. And for the first time, the English was ruled by a Scottish king. And his authorized version of the Bible is still read today. Exactly. Yeah. The King James Six. Version. Um, you want to tell everybody a little bit about Oliver Cromwell? Well, I, I know he was a roundhead, which they were Puritan. They were Calvinists. They were definitely anti-monarchists. They thought that England should be ruled by Parliament and with a, with a head figure at Parliament who could be uh, disposed of through the electoral process. What happened is, in the long run, Cromwell and the Parliamentists succeeded in dethroning the monarchy, which was very unpopular at, at that time. The problem was, Puritans put in their own brand of government, which was pretty stifling. It was just right. about as bad as everybody else. And they had their own form of the Inquisition. So they really exactly. didn't, they, they had this golden opportunity to turn England into a democracy and they blew it completely. Exactly. And, and you know, the interesting thing is that Cromwell had a law in the land. Nobody could celebrate Christmas. And mm -hmm. he sent the police through on Christmas Day to see if they could smell goose being cooked because that was a traditional meal was roasted goose. And if he smelt goose cooking, the people were imprisoned. So yeah. it, it, they were very strict on what they wanted it to be. They wanted a Puritan government. It, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a bad thing because what it does is it turns you into a Pharisee. And that's exactly, exactly what happened to England during this period of time. So much so that after Cromwell's death, and he held kind of a vice grip on, on the government, but when he died, the whole thing fell apart. It's you know? Isn't that amazing? Let's talk about this, what was going on in Scotland at the same time that the Protestant Reformation was going on in England. There was a, a Protestant Reformation going on in Scotland also, led by John Knox. Now, the boiling point came one Sunday when John Knox was allowed to speak in the local Catholic church in Perch. His speech so inflamed the crowd that when the priest attempted to give Mass... A riot broke out and all the statues in the church were destroyed. Now, after ransacking that church, the mob went down the street and destroyed the other churches in the community. Now, this enraged the Catholic Queen Mary, which was we know as the Mary Queen of Scott. And she responded by calling in the French troops to stop the revolt. However, the English joined with the Scots. There was 11,000 English soldiers and 2,000 Scott protesters, and they drove out the French troops. In August of that same year, the Scottish Parliament stopped and abolished the Catholic rule in the Scottish churches, and mass was outlawed. The Presbyterian Church was now the official church of Scotland, which was a Protestant church. Now, they even went further. And John Knox, the Knots also urged the adoption of the Mosaic Law as the governing rule of Scotland. Under it, certain crimes such as murder, blasphemy, adultery, perjury, and idolatry were punishable by death. It's unbelievable history. They stopped the celebration of Christmas, and there was public stonings of priests in the streets. 
Prophecy is something that's cyclical, travels in, a, in patterns, and it repeats itself. Now, it become very apparent that God sent an awakening to the people of England during this time of history. And may we all pray that God sends an awakening and a revival in this land also. And with that, we need to close. We're going to say good night to all and blessings to all. Good night. Good night.